for the last 13 years, uh, Professor Jovan Kurbalia, director of Diplo, has prepared a prediction text, which is followed by an online discussion, the one that we're having right now. And here we are today. Now, next up, uh, in a few minutes, I'll invite Jovan to moderate the prediction conversation. But before I pass the floor on to him, I'd like to introduce our lead discussants today. And once we have them on our screen, Yes. So I'll start with Sir, Mr. Wolfgang Kleinwacher, Professor of Internet Governance, who will give us his gist of 2023 from his outlook that he has published yesterday. Mr. Asoke Mukherjee, former Indian ambassador, he will be reflecting on the important role India will play in Digital 2023 as host of two important processes, the G20, and the Shanghai Cooperation Council. Ms. Marilia Maciel, internet governance expert from Brazil, who will speak more on Brazil's return to global digital politics and IBSA's digital momentum. And IBSA stands for India, Brazil, and South Africa. And then we have Ms. Catherine Gatel, leading cybersecurity expert from Kenya. She will be telling us all about digital and cyber, cyber trends in Africa. We have Mr. Richard Burley, Block EU correspondent, and he will be reflecting on the EU's digital dynamics for 2023. Looking forward to that. And finally, Mr. Rodney Taylor, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunication Union. He will be bringing us digital governance perspectives from the Caribbean and other small island states. And as Diplo's tradition, we always try to have the most interactive uh, discussions, whether it's in situ or online or hybrid. So we have our very own Ginger and Katarina as our uh, chat moderators. So please, at any point during the discussion, feel free to ask questions or make your comments uh, through the Zoom chat, and they will be addressed uh, by Ginger, Katarina, and myself. And another note about the schedule of the event is after the prediction webinar, we will have an extra 30 minutes uh, for anyone who wants to de delve deeper on the subjects that we will uh, start discussing in a bit with our panelists, with Diplo experts and AI predictions. And I will let you more, uh, I will let you know more about this at the end of the webinar, which will take an hour. And now, finally, let's see what digital trends and predictions uh, we have lying in ahead, uh, ahead of us for 2023. Jovan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Susonia. Happy, happy New Year. Best wishes to all of you, your families, organization, and to all of us as a humanity. In the time which is not simple and not easy, somebody call it as a perm crisis or permanent uh, crisis era. Uh, in order to kick off discussion, I will uh, just reflect on three points from the 12 uh, points prediction for this year, which uh, I uh, published uh, last week. And then we'll pass uh, to our uh, lead discussant and panelist, reflecting on various aspects from their regional, professional, and other perspectives. The first point uh, which is important is so-called revisiting of the 1998 uh, deals. Sometimes we forget that there is a bit of long history of digital governance, and it is exactly 1998, where most of the current uh, arrangement for the digital governance and cooperation were set in motion. In September 1998, Google was established. Uh, Again, in the, the same month, ICANN, International Corporation for Assigned Numbers and uh, Names and Numbers was established. WTO uh, uh, um, introduced e-commerce uh, agenda. In November, uh, 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 at that time, the kickoff of the cybersecurity declaration uh, the negotiation at the UN was made with the Russian uh, resolution, which was later on adopted by the General Assembly. In November, 1998, we had ITU Minneapolis plenipotentially where the decision was made to 
organize World Summit on Information Society and Internet Governance Forum and other bodies. If you analyze what is happening currently, you will see that exactly that structure was set in motion 25 years ago. The word technology is moving fast, but technology governance is rather slow in evolution, much slower than technology. I think generally speaking for the good reason. But we are now speaking about completely different world 25 years later, with geopolitical aspects of the digital governance, with almost 60% of global population connected. Now it is right time to discuss possible revisiting of the 1998 deals. The second point in this context is what I label that as IPSA momentum. IPSA momentum relates to India, Brazil, South Africa, three countries which will chair, which will be in the leadership of G20. India is this year, Brazil is next year, and in 2025 is South Africa. Three countries which are democracies, functional democracies, which are develop, developing economies and strong supporters of the diplomacy and multilateral diplomacy. Therefore, three Ds for IPSA, IPSA countries. An interesting momentum when there are tensions between China, United States and other actors. And third point, which I would like to highlight is centrality of data governance negotiations. India already marked importance of data for their presidency of G20. Japan is positioning itself probably with the IGF of discussion on data. In the WTO, negotiation on e-commerce data is central, not to speak about Brussels, European Union, centrality of GDPR and data and other issues. Therefore, three points. Revisiting 1998 deals, second, IPSA momentum, and third, data governance. That's from my side. Now I'm really honored and pleased to uh, kick off the discussion with the comments from Wolfgang. Those of you who are new to this field, uh, 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 I just would like to introduce Wolfgang as a key contributor, academic and practical to the discussions. And he, like me, he's publishing every year outlook for the for 2023. Now, it's a long document, very in-depth, and I advise everybody to consult this uh, fantastic contribution by Wolfgang. And I asked Wolfgang to do almost a mission impossible to summarize in five minutes his, uh, his uh, outlook for, the, uh, for, the, for this year. Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Jovan. And it's really great to see your approach that you remember um, 1998, uh, a quarter of a century ago, and you, I, you are absolutely right that basic structures has been uh, established um, uh, 25 years ago, and we are still living from the input we got 25 years ago. The big differences uh, between 1998 and 2023 20, uh, is that 25 years ago, Internet governance was seen uh, more as a technical issue with some political implications. Uh, but today, all Internet, cyber, digital issues are political issues with a technical component. Uh, so this is now the all the issues which were discussed 25 years ago in a smaller community are now in the center of global diplomacy, of global policy making, of global conflicts, as we see in the Ukraine war and in other uh, confrontational uh, spheres around the globe. What I have seen over the 25 years, so I was involved in the making of ICANN 25 years ago and uh, followed this Minneapolis versus uh, Cambridge uh, debate, uh, which produced then for a lot of years the ICANN ITU controversy, um, is that we have more or less a schizophrenic situation. That on the one hand, so we see uh, a, a huge progress in promotion of digital cooperation, uh, where uh, people realize uh, digital development is uh, good for economic growth to 
bring uh, people out of poverty. Uh, there are a lot of uh, success stories in bridging the digital divide. We have now 5 billion internet users, uh, even if 3 billion are still offline, but this is much more than people expected 25 years ago. Uh, so, and, and, um, so that means there are a lot of really uh, very, very uh, progressive things happened and for the young generation now, I think the internet environment and the, the ability to communicate across borders uh, in real time uh, is, 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 is um, like air. So they do not think about uh, that this could collapse uh, because they take it for granted that they can send uh, their uh, comments and chats and, and uh, all their pictures and video clips around the globe in real time. At the same time, you know, uh, uh, the cyberspace became a very dangerous space. So it started with the first uh, cyber worms and cyber criminal activities already in the early 2000s. It moved into the uh, intergovernmental military field with the Stuxnet. And what we have now is not only an exploding cyber crime with tremendous ransomware attacks, which where the, the loss goes into the billions of dollars, but with the Ukraine war, we see now that uh, uh, cyber and digital tools are pulled into a real war. So that means the, the understanding we had in the last couple of years, also supported by a lot of academic papers, that in the um, uh, 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 conventional war with death and destruction is a thing of the 20th century and the 21st century. If there is a war, it will be a cyber war, uh, which uh, will aim at chaos and confusion on the enemy side and death and destruction more or less has disappeared. But what they have seen now in the Ukraine war is that there is no conventional war and cyber war. A war is a war is a war. It's like in the old and new economy discussion 20 years ago. There is no old war and new war. A war is a war is a war. And this uh, will trigger more problems in the future with uh, on the horizon internet-based new autonomous weapon systems. We see the role of drones now, which are you know using internet infrastructure. So all these are very negative tendencies. So what okay. we have is a oh, conflict okay. between digital cooperation and cyber confrontation. And unfortunately, this is will be the outlook for 2023. Thank you. Back to thank you. you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for uh, anchoring what is ahead of us in this evolution from both policy and security and academic discussion. And as always, very insightful thoughts. I'm sure there will be quite a few questions. Uh, and thank you for sticking to five minutes from this really summarizing this really um, um, impressive uh, analysis that you published yesterday. Now we move to, to, to New Delhi. And uh, as you will see, we are trying to bring different perspectives and to switch from traditional, let's say, um, a way of uh, viewing internet governance thing to hearing from, uh, from other regions where new dynamism is happening. We have with us Ambassador um, 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 uh, Ashoke Muheji, who is a person uh, uh, currently a retired Indian ambassador involved in the helping Indian governments on many issues, including G20, but also a person who was in the trenches of digital governance when he was permanent representative in New York. Ashoki, what is for you uh, from uh, India's perspective, especially about this IPSA momentum, G20? How do you see 2023? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Yovan. And uh, I am <laughs> really happy that uh, I am here today. I am from the 1998 generation, having negotiated the WTO decision on uh, moratorium on electronic commerce, but also having negotiated the Internet Technology Agreement, uh, which made a huge difference uh, on the ground, at least in India. Uh, it allowed us to become a software exporter. So from that perspective and the perspective of aligning the Tunis agenda with the sustainable development goals in 2015, I think that today, when we look at the landscape ahead of us this year, um, here in India, we are going to go through uh, three major changes uh, domestically. And uh, these changes are linked to bringing a predictable uh, transparent legal framework for India's emergence uh, in the digital world. 
The first is a, a, a telecoms bill, which will replace uh, the existing law of 1883. It's a long, long time ago that the British introduced their, wireless, uh, their laws to India. We are changing it this year. It will throw up uh, some uh, challenges, and I'll be happy to discuss those challenges later. The second is uh, a Digital uh, Personal Data Act. Uh, that's something that uh, has been uh, talked about. In July this year, the first draft of that will be presented to our parliament, and that will uh, take uh, on board issues uh, which are topical in our discussions of uh, privacy, especially privacy and the role of the state and the individual. And the third legislation is called the Digital India Act. And that will update uh, the existing law on which India is, uh, has, has progressed from the year 2000, which is the Information Technology Act. As the minister, when introducing this, explained the Information Technology Act didn't even have the word internet. So we can imagine what uh, these three laws will do. Now, moving from that into the G20, uh, India's focus is primarily going to be to, uh, to bring into the G20 uh, action plan the experience that India has had in applying uh, the digital technologies to development. And I think that in this, there are three uh, areas that have been identified as priorities. The first is uh, digital public infrastructure. Now, the digital public infrastructure is uh, going, uh, going to focus on uh, six uh, broad areas the economy, finance, government, health, uh, and education. And it's going to try and show that with the use of digital technologies, we can uh, accelerate development as well as make government uh, governance more effective and responsive. Uh, so that's uh, the focus and uh, India's experience on introducing uh, innovations like the United Payments Interface, which brings a, a, a large number of banking applications into one platform, uh, which I can discuss again later, is going to be uh, one of the showpieces. Uh, along with that is uh, digital skill. Now, this is something that is linked with uh, the entire ecosystem of startups, of uh, innovation, of uh, research of encouraging people to, to, to respond to the changing world in new ways. And I think that there too, India's experience in uh, today, we are one of the largest uh, sort of examples of startups in the world, uh, is going to play a role in sharing this experience with uh, other countries, uh, including the G20, but even beyond the G20. And the third is a very, very strong area where we have uh, consistently uh, voiced uh, our experience and our aspirations, and that is in uh, capacity building, in digital skill development. Uh, this is something that uh, has been a, 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 a pillar for, uh, for India's experience, uh, not only inside these governmental processes, but also in the global uh, uh, cyber, uh, conferences on cyberspace, the GCCS, where we have uh, re-hosted uh, the last one in 2017. So that, these are the three uh, priorities that I see ahead. And I'll be happy to come back uh, to any of these issues in the session that uh, follows. Thank you, uh, Yohan. Thank you. Thank you, Ashoke. Uh, somehow uh, we missed something on data, but you can come later on because the chair of the uh, uh, Sherpa published the article putting data as a priority, but you can reflect later on on it. What was interesting in your reflection uh, was that there is a document, one of the legislation without mentioning internet. And uh, I advise you to read another interesting document, which is a Swedish presidency document. Uh, you know, the Sweden took over the presidency of European Union. Obviously, Sweden is very advanced IT economy, but in their document, there is no chapter on digital. But if, when you analyze, you have chapter on economy, on justice, on security, you have digital horizontally integrated. Even conceptually speaking, there is no any more dedicated digital chapter, but that's horizontal uh, inclusion. It's an interesting shift in the, in, the, in the language and the way of framing documents like what you, Ashoka, mentioned. We are moving now to, 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 to Latin America, not physically, Marilia is based in Europe, but she's a Brazilian internet governance expert. Obviously, we are following carefully what's going on in uh, Brazil. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, of high importance for the, uh, for the rest of the world, but for, for digital governance, 
Brazil used to be one of the key players. Uh, it organized the Net Mundial Summit in 2014. Uh, can we expect Brazil back? And uh, if yes, uh, in what uh, form? Back to the global digital governance. Marilia. Thank you, Jovan. It's great to see so many familiar faces and, and names and Happy New Year, everyone. I think that we cannot really speak of a comeback because uh, Brazil did not uh, leave uh, digital diplomatic scene during this uh, very um, politically shaky last years. There were some discontinuities during the Bolsonaro government, especially in areas such as human rights and gender that did affect digital policies. But by and large, Brazil continued to be uh, an important player in discussions such as e-commerce, cybersecurity, uh, and also via BRICS, uh, which made a lot of progress in terms of their coordination in recent years. To me, the question is not whether Brazil will come back, but given the recent change in government, if Brazil would be willing uh, to take a more of a leadership role in certain digital discussions as it did during Net Mundial. And there are some indications already. Uh, it's very early in the government, but we can see some signs that digital issues will be more important um, for this government. First of all, if we look at the Brazilian administration um, from a, a bureaucratic perspective, we can see in the organigram of the government that there is more attention in terms of digital, in terms of creating, for instance, a specific secretariat to deal with uh, digital policies, uh, which will look into issues such as media pluralism, media literacy, disinformation, fake news, which is a big issue in the country now. But at the same time, we can also see from the organogram that there is a, a dispersion of digital topics across different ministries and across different secretariats. One can see uh, this as a good thing, such as uh, in the Swedish government. However, we noticed so far a lack of clear mechanisms for coordination. So there could be a danger that this could create repetition um, and not a healthy overlap, and that could be somewhat paralyzing to the government. But some interesting changes have happened as well in the Brazilian administration in, in recent times when it comes to foreign policy. If we look at uh, the Ministry of Foreign Relations uh, in the last years, digital issues have been finally unpacked uh, and there are new homes for, the, for, for them. Um, before, all things digital were aggregated inside a very small division in Itamaraty, which was uh, overloaded and, and understaffed. Uh, but now there are dedicated different bodies to deal with issues such as cyber and digital economy. And that is very positive because that will lead uh, for more specialization, more depth in terms of policy development and implementation. So this was a good thing in terms of this restructuring of Itamaraty to deal with digital. Um, moreover, there are very positive signs that the dialogue between the government and civil society will be much better than in previous government. Uh, it has been strengthened. Um, Brazilian civil society has been a focus of giving ideas to the government. If we think about Marco Civil, for instance, the civil rights framework for the internet, which was uh, quite of a landmark regulation, the idea came from civil society. So who knows, maybe there are some great ideas coming from this interplay um, between government and civil society in these next uh, four years. But if we look at the political context, I think it's very difficult to compare the moment today and the moment of Net Mundial. Um, Inside Brazil, the, the political situation is very different. Um, Brazil is immersed in a socioeconomic crisis. There is problems with rising poverty, political polarization. So there's a very heavy internal agenda uh, that will take resources and will probably mobilize political bodies more inwards than outwards. Um, and the global political context is also very different. In 2014, we had a very acute digital crisis, uh, mass surveillance, Snowden revelations, uh, which made the headlines everywhere. Um, now I think we are facing a potentially bigger crisis in terms of social media and the threat that this represents to democracy and in terms of the potential fragmentation of the internet. But these crises, they are not so acute and they are difficult to pin down and to translate to the general public. They are difficult to to, to, to place in terms of a political agenda with concrete results. They're difficult, but they're not impossible. So can Brazil use its soft power on digital to transform this potential crisis, democracy, fragmentation into catalysts for action? 
And Brazil has a very clear interest when it comes to, to online democracy. It has the legitimacy to talk about that, especially after what happened in Congress. So can it take one step forward in this direction? And if it does, then which would be the best forum to discuss these issues? Um, BRICS has been the most active mechanism for coordination on digital issues for Brazil. Um, however, it's not the best forum to discuss democracy or fragmentation. For these reasons, I think that perhaps IBSA seems like a much more well-suited forum. Um, IBSA had a very, very important um, moment of protagonism back in, in 2012 when it made concrete proposals when it comes to the governance of the internet and its architecture. But after that, it went in a sort of a dormant state. Um, unlike previous governments, Lula understands uh, the importance of uh, IBSA in the international scenario. So will, we, will he work to recreate IBSA in terms of its proactivity? And could this risk of fragmentation and the problem of democracy mobilize the three IBSA countries and provide them a concrete agenda. If it doesn't, then I think that another potential agenda could be what you mentioned, uh, Jovan, uh, the, the issue of the, the governance of data, uh, which will be important in the G20 context, which will be something that will certainly come up in the UN uh, summit in a couple of years. Uh, but in this discussion, the economic aspects of data governance, I think India and South Africa are more developed in terms of thinking. Brazil has discussed data governance a lot, but more from a data protection angle in the last years because it has recently approved that uh, data protection regulation. So maybe perhaps to summarize in a very uh, Twitter style, uh, Brazil, yes, more interested on digital, definitely. Uh, possibly more active too. We need to see how the political uh, environment will evolve uh, internally. And IBSA, still a very interesting forum for digital discussions. On Brazil's side, I think there's a very, very uh, good opportunity with Lula to bring IBSA back. Let's see if he will do that or not. Thank you, Jovan. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilia, for, for this really a forward-looking summary and what we can expect from Brazil. When I said, the, is Brazil back? I I refer to the leadership role that Brazil had with Net Mundial, with the uh, local internet, the multi-stakeholder structure and uh, other, other issues. I will go quickly through the comments before we move to uh, Kate Gatao and the uh, African perspective. Federico, you ask uh, why there are no fintech perspectives uh, in the digital trends. There is a section on digital economy or uh, cyber currency. Yeah, there are so many issues, but uh, we had to select 12, uh, 12 developments. And one can argue that probably fintech should be should have been the part of it. Uh, Nadia, you mentioned why Sweden doesn't have a dedicated digital chapter. And we just heard from Marilia that trends with Itamarai, with uh, Brazil and other countries is to streamline digital horizontally. And we heard it also from India. Therefore, I think that Sweden uh, with the, their presidency document is basically uh, leading this trend. Let's see what are the concrete digital or cyber aspects of justice, crime, uh, economy, security, and other issues. And yes, they are uh, co-leads of the global digital compact negotiation together with Rwanda. It's very interesting. Also a uh, choice and quite, quite, quite promising in this, this context. Then we had a few, uh, few other comments on Africa, smart Africa, uh, and uh, we will get back to the, to the, to the other details uh, later on. We move to Nairobi to Kate Getao and the African perspective. What is ahead of us uh, in 2023 from um, seen from uh, from Nairobi? Kat. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jovan, and uh, good day and happy New Year uh, to everyone. Uh, well, Africa is a big continent to uh, represent. Uh, but I'll try my best. Um, well, 2023, I think globally looks like being another challenging year. Um, obviously, uh, COVID and uh, climate change uh, pressures have hit economies hard. Uh, and it is clear uh, to me that uh, in many African countries, the digital agenda has taken a slight uh, backseat uh, because uh, many countries are grappling 
uh, with other serious issues such as drought, uh, increasing food prices, um, unemployment, and, and other such pressures. At the same time, uh, we can recognize that uh, since your uh, key date of 1998, there has been substantial changes in many Africa, emerging African economies uh, where there is more investment in services, in ICT, in infrastructure and so on. Uh, and I think that has already borne fruit uh, because that diversification of economies has created uh, a situation where uh, it is helping us to weather the pressure on the traditional industries such as uh, tourism, agriculture, and so on. And therefore governments continue to recognize uh, digital as a very important contributor uh, to economies. And I'd say uh, the trends we need to watch in Africa, firstly, uh, there appears to be a trend towards a lot of regional unity. Uh, the free trade area, of course, is uh, one of the success stories in this area. Uh, but we also see, I mean, recently, uh, Kenya and South Africa uh, also made uh, an agreement. So there's a recognition that we need to work together as uh, the African Union, NEPAD, and uh, other regional bodies have been pushing to, uh, for, uh, for many years. But this seems to be happening now. And uh, the Smart Africa Initiative, um, among others, is uh, a recognition of this trend now in the digital area. Uh, South Africa, Rwanda, Ghana, you know, a few countries are um, positioning themselves as leaders uh, in this area. So I think this is a trend uh, we uh, must watch in 2023. But as we make these agreements, of course, it's going to become critical uh, for cyber uh, diplomacy and proper uh, legal and regulatory frameworks uh, to support the activities that will open up as a result of these regional uh, initiatives. Uh, and therefore, uh, I'll have a wish list rather than uh, to say what I'm really predicting is going to happen. Uh, firstly, I believe that there needs to be an educational response. Um, we have uh, several schools of diplomacy in the continent, and I believe it is time for there to be a push towards cyber diplomacy becoming a serious topic uh, that can support uh, the development of foreign uh, ministries across the continent. Uh, the second is institutional responses. Um, there's been fairly good development of legislation and uh, rigor and regulatory frameworks, both in the cyber uh, crime and uh, the data uh, privacy and protection area. Um, and this is a good institutional response, but this also needs to be uh, uh, buttressed. Uh, with a recognition that uh, non-traditional ministries need to have uh, full support of having uh, dedicated cyber expertise uh, within those institutions. Um, in terms, uh, there's also the area of infrastructure and standards. And I think, you know, I listened to Ashok and, you know, the plans they have in this area. And uh, that is also true of Africa. And we know that uh, the AU has been um, pushing for a more integrated approach to infrastructure development uh, across the continent. And I believe there's going to be renewed interest in that area, uh, again, to support the one network area, for the free trade area and so on, uh, that are coming up because without that infrastructure, without the legal and regulatory uh, area without the institutions and without the awareness and the skills, uh, it's going to be very challenging uh, to protect the activities that uh, are going to be taking place. Now, you also asked about new technologies, and I'll just briefly say that in that area, I, I do see uh, that there's going to be a growth uh, from um, just uh, implement uh, applying like a lot of people um, 
invested in cryptocurrency, of course, some of them have taken a serious hit. Uh, so I believe in a way this is uh, going to be a good thing because we're going to move from uh, just uh, adopting or trying to exploit this technology uh, to actually contextualizing the technology and uh, appreciating how it can be implemented to solve the actual priority issues that we have on our continent. And I think I've, uh, I'm near to completing my five minutes, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Kat, as always, for a great intro and concrete suggestions on uh, uh, training on cyber diplomacy. What you said about uh, existence of uh, good documents is uh, what uh, was surprising discovery of our research on uh, African digital foreign policy and diplomacy. There are excellent documents, and uh, but the problem is uh, lack of institutions and lack of the institutional capacity to implement them. And I'm sure that quite a few countries are looking for, we have uh, 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 today with us Ambassador Wexler, uh, Benedict Wexler, the Swiss digital envoy. And I know it's Switzerland, pioneer development of digital foreign policy strategy and introduction. Therefore, countries can look for these experiences. Also, we have uh, experience from Australia, from Netherlands, from quite a few other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Just one comment. I see that chat GPT, what else? Uh, um, get a lot of traction from Alud, from other colleagues. Uh, we are going to have one, one interesting experiment. Today's session will be transcribed by uh, advanced AI system developed by Diplo and summarized. That was what we are doing in parallel to our teaching and other activities. We are experimenting with new algorithms for, uh, for diplomacy. Now we move uh, uh, to Brussels, to uh, Richard Valley, the journalist, EU correspondent of the Swiss newspaper Blick and the keen observer of uh, political, uh, economic, technological development. If you follow uh, French uh, TV, you can see uh, Richard almost uh, every second evening on the uh, quite a popular person in France. Uh, my, my daughter always says, oh, you see Richard is on TV. Therefore, Richard, <laughs> we are honored to have you with us here in addition to the, all this French TV station. What is, going, what is happening in Brussels and what, what we can expect on digital and geopolitics? Thank you, Jovan, and good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. It's been said already, so I'm going to repeat it. Well, clearly from Brussels, you will not be surprised. I will come up mainly with information about pieces of legislation and pieces of norms and regulation, because this is what Brussels is for. And this is what has been discussed here in the European Commission headquarters. So if I would summarize uh, the strategy of Brussels of the European Union towards, uh, let's say, the digital issues, I would use this sentence, Europe is back. That's, I believe, the sentence that summarizes what Commission Thierry Breton is the commissioner in charge of digital affairs. He's French. He will be in charge until 2024 because this will be the time of a new European election. Yes, Europe is back on the digital front, and that would be true for three main items. First of all, you may have heard this word, it's coming originally mostly from France, but it's been used now very much in the European arena. It is sovereignty. Sovereignty uh, because of the war in Ukraine, because of the challenges that Europe is facing with the US now on the industrial area with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, the idea of sovereignty. And I think for the first time ever, now all 27 government of member states agree that digital policy is absolutely part of the European sovereignty. And I think 2023 will be the year when we will start to realize whether Europe, Europe meaning the European Union, has enough tools and enough strength to achieve uh, what it wants. The, so the first point is bringing Europe back on the front of digital sovereignty. Then we talk about data. Uh, where do we keep the data? We talk about the instrument. We talk about also uh, about helping uh, some EU company to, to be able to compete with American giants. The second word I will keep for 2023 is the word uh, uh, 
priorities. For the first time, I think, after the DSA, Digital Service Act, that we saw earlier, uh, the European Union has made quite a tremendous work to define its priorities. I will send you in the chat box several key documents that were issued last year, especially uh, the Digital Targets 2030. So there is a road now for the European Union to go um, in terms of digital affairs, and I think it's pretty important. Now, third is the obstacles, because you can't talk about predictions without mentioning the obstacles that Europe is facing. I see myself in 2023, three main obstacles for the European Union. First obstacle is, is the very same that Europe has in terms of defense. I mean, in terms of hard defense, of military defense. You've got some countries who believe within European Union that it's better to ally with the United States rather than to talk in Brussels and to unite in Brussels. It is true for hard defense. It is true also for what we may call digital defense. It is very clear that countries like Poland, for example, are not very much eager to enter into discussion with the EU towards a digital agenda. The, the government in Warsaw trusts more what is being done in the US. Uh, one sign of the willingness from Europe to act, I should mention, it is not only an anecdote, a diplomatic anecdote, is the recent opening of an EU mission in the Silicon Valley. Uh, you may say it should have been done far before, but it's been finally done in 2022. So first obstacle is the traditional European divide. Second obstacle is the money. When you want to move hard in digital issues, you need to invest. And there are too many fields at the moment where the European Union has to invest. It has to invest in its defense, I mean, in tanks, in, in whatever will be required to foster its defense. It needs to invest into its economy because the prediction, you know, are, are quite dire at the moment. So will Europe find the money to invest in digital affairs? And I think that will be probably part of the plan that the EU is keen to achieve in 2020. 23rd, another plan of uh, mutual mutual debt, but it's not yet been agreed far from there. Then the third, the third obstacle I see is the question of, uh, let's say, concept. And clearly on that front, you've got some countries who believe that EU should come back digital wise through private company, through the private sector. That would be more the case for Germany. Uh, and some other countries believe it's through the public sector, and that would be more the case for France. So the traditional, another traditional divide is here. So Europe is back, at least the sentence is in the air, but will Europe be able to make it concrete in 2023rd? I think that will be the challenge for the year to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh... Richard, for an excellent summary, three keywords, sovereignty, priorities, obstacles, and the, and the details on the obstacles, uh, what are the concrete, very useful uh, sort of, let's say, checkbook for the, for the U European Union in 2023. Now, we move to the Caribbean region and um, uh, Rodney Taylor, uh, Secretary General of the uh, Caribbean Telecommunication Union, and we ask him to reflect on definitely Caribbean region, but also small island states in this context of the uh, mega movements and big actors and big players. Rodney, over to you. Thank you very much, Jovan. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, bring a perspective from the Caribbean. And in fact, uh, I, I wholly, wholly support many of the, all of the speakers before. Uh, and I would like to say from our perspective that 2023 will see greater participation in terms of the internet governance space uh, of small island developing states. And in fact, we have, I think we are starting off on a, on a great uh, footing here uh, by having a regional perspective from the Caribbean. Um, I think we will see this throughout other, um, other international processes within the ITU. Uh, we saw last year at the plenipotentiary conference a very strong showing from the Caribbean, a uh, stronger move to work with other small island developing states, including the, but, but not not exclusively, but including the Pacific Islands, uh, push for greater collaboration between SIDS as well and the African countries. And I think this is a good thing and it will give more meaning to uh, the term multi-stakeholderism 
I think ICANN and any of the other organizations recognize that there are underserved groups within uh, the organizations, within the international policy development process. And this is very important uh, for us to have perspective from small states. Um, there's been collaboration on things like the UN Global Digital Compact, and uh, again, bringing SIDS perspective, but also um, with an emphasis on women and youth from small island developing states. Uh, we see, of course, the election of, um, in terms of the gender issue, the election for the first female secretary general of the ITU in over 150 years. So maybe there are implications for how the institution is run in some of the areas that it will focus on. Um, the current SG, former director of BDT, and place a great emphasis on, on, on youth, for example, the Generation Connect initiative. So I expect to see more of that. There will, coming out of that, also be a greater push to for global connectivity. Again, the partner to connect, which was a big part of the World Telecoms Development Conference, a very big issue for developing countries that are remain part of the, the biggest chunk of that unconnected global population. Um, there will be implications for regulation of big tech and OTTs because they, in a sense, because of the innovation that they are pushing, it does impact telecommunication services, the ability for existing and traditional telcos to invest into next generation technologies um, because they fall out of the regulatory frameworks. And I think we'll see a greater push towards regulation of these, of these companies, um, not just in terms of uh, but in terms of the, the services that they offer, but also in terms of regulation of content. Um, content. Uh, and maybe AI will help in terms of providing regu regulatory um, technical capacity. Cybersecurity will be an issue, continues to be an issue. Um, and uh, for small states with limited resources, and uh, I believe there'll be great support from, from SIDS for the UN efforts because of the multilateral um, opportunities for participation that these these uh, institutions provide there'll be uh, support for UN resolutions and so on that that push cybersecurity and human rights on the internet uh, on the geopolitical side um, that's uncertain for me but uh, certainly small states don't play well I would say in uh, global geopolitics uh, in fact the founding part of father of Barbados where I'm from in his UN speech uh, during the Cold War said we that really we are friends of all and satellites of none. Uh, we, we tend not to get caught up too much in the geopolitics because of our small and vulnerable state. Of course, we do have a voice and stand up for human rights and justice, but uh, geopolitics is something on a totally different um, level. I would say that post pandemic, there's a huge opportunity for SIDS in particular with respect to digital nomads and remote work. Uh, many com companies, large companies have, have uh, implemented permanent policies that allow employees to work uh, permanently from home. Uh, of course, some some companies are reversing that, but I think the pandemic has shown us that uh, there there's a huge opportunity. I mean, this is this is what the internet really is about: the ability to connect from anywhere and do anything and work any place. Uh, but of course, for this connectivity, reliable, fast, and secure is very important. Um, and is at the top of the list if you're thinking of a place to work remotely. Um, it makes sense, but the pandemic has shown a spotlight on it. And again, it brings great opportunities. If you can work from anywhere in the world, why not work from a beautiful Caribbean country or a Pacific Island right next to the beach, you know, as opposed to being, you know, stuck in a, in a skyscraper someplace. Um, Rodney, we, we, we preclude, the, we don't allow the PR, but it's such a nice PR that you are, <laughs> you, you have immunity. And I can tell you in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, especially if it is combined with liming concept, that would be a great thing. Let us know Excellent. your last that's point it. and then. Well, that, that's it. Um, I, I would say that, um, yeah, it's, that's one of the big opportunities for us as developing countries. And I hope that trend continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Rodney, what uh, you brought the issues which are, there are so many connections in the in the presentation. We uh, exhausted the list and this tour the horizon from India, um, uh, Africa, Brazil, uh, Europe, um, uh, Caribbean region. Now, before we uh, ask our panelists to reflect on what they heard and the question, I would like to invite Sue Sonia to give us the gist of discussion in the chat room, which I can see is very, very active. Obviously, Richard mentioned concept of sovereignty and it immediately triggers the avalanche of comments. Therefore, that's uh, that was really 
Nice point. So, Sonia, over to you. Thank you, Ovan. Uh, as you've said, there's a great discussion, lively discussion going on in uh, chat ever since the, the our event started. So some of the main points were about, for example, cybersecurity from Leza saying, um, how can we turn tech cybersecurity into an enabler and how can checks and balances can be enforced? And another question was, uh, which regulations can be adhered to among between friends and nations? Uh, Vlada addressed this uh, saying we have to better understand roles and responsibilities of various actors in implementing existing rules, for example, the Geneva Dialogue Project, and to explore what certain positive practices, best practices uh, that there are already out there and uh, maybe work on standardizing them across different jurisdictions and harmonizing uh, legal frameworks. And of course, uh, our participants touched upon um, generative AI tools, such as uh, chat G GPT, stable diffusion, and whether or not if they can have a lasting impact on digital governance and diplomacy uh, for more details uh, you can go back in the our participants can go back in the chat and as, uh, also join the dedicated breakout rooms once the session ends to uh, talk deeper about these questions and another question was uh, from Suhila Amazos was how will the EU reconciliate digital sovereignty with the concept of the open internet? And uh, between our panelists, from Morelia to Richard, um, there was another question about sovereignty. How sovereign can the can EU policy on digital be vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US, especially on difficult issues such as uh, relations with China? And uh, she has said it's it seems like the war in Ukraine pushed the EU back a couple of years when it comes to independent thinking. And now has to the EU has to rely on the US as a protective big brother. So maybe uh, these points could be some points yeah. to reflect uh, on our last round with our discussions. And uh, thank you, Yovan. Thank you, Susonia. And for all of you making the comments, as, as uh, Susonia indicated, there will be this extra half an hour where we can dive deeper in specific uh, issues. Uh, Michael Kenden mentioned an interesting point on uh, on the, that trying the telecom operators in Europe, trying to get a bit of pie from the US tech uh, companies. And it is one of the issues which is on the agenda also in uh, in Brussels. We are now going uh, to our uh, panelists. Uh, you heard a lot. You heard the comments from the audience. You heard the inputs from uh, from the colleagues on the, on, on the panel. Wolfgang, um, we'll start with you. And I know that many things, including Net Mundial and other issues, are on your mind and you were a big promoter of these concepts. Uh, but again, we are constrained with the time. Few points from you uh, on uh, 2023 and what you heard uh, so far. Over to you. One thing, uh, I fear that we see more of a, what we call now an internet bifurcation, that we have the big US-Chinese conflict and we see around the US, we have the OECD, the G7, and on the other side, so we have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we have parts of BRICS, and so the Chinese efforts to institutionalize the World Internet Conference is a reaction to the um, American initiative for the declaration of the future of the internet. So this would be bad. Uh, the better approach is to look more into what the United Nations offers. And here we have two big things for 2023. One is to work on the Global Digital Compact. This could become a mayor process, not only an event or a project, a process which would mobilize the multi-stakeholder community to uh, dig deeper into the positive sides of digital development. And then we have the very complicated project on the UN Convention on Cybercrime. So it, they have a tough timetable. They want to present a new universal treaty until August 2023. So if this would be achieved, then we would have a good balance uh, to have more on the positive, constructive side for digital cooperation and probably less on the destructive cyber conflicts. Back to you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for a great summary. And you related to what, for example, Rodney said that uh, 
Caribbean countries are not comfortable with uh, with uh, siding with any of the major major power. And again, the UN and UN role is becoming even uh, more important, not just as nominally important global body, but also place which can create this inclusive space and protection for small and developing countries in the case of the potential new digital Cold War. And Mark Harwell, great to have you, Mark, with us, uh, mentioned digital commons for public good as important aspect which Tech Envoy may bring uh, to uh, to uh, overall uh, the, the, the wave. Ashok, uh, we are moving to, to you. And there is one point. Uh, Volga mentioned uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India will also host this year the meeting, annual meeting of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Is India trying to connect various dots across different divides and maybe foster this global cooperation? Time for your comments, any comment, but I was curious about that as well. Thank you, uh, Johan. I think that uh, we need to recognize uh, how each of these three processes you mentioned are driven. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has a secretariat driven process, and that secretariat is based in headquartered in Beijing. So I think that uh, to expect any uh, sort of radical uh, movement uh, from the part of the organization of the SCO under India's presidency is uh, really uh, not realistic. Uh, this, the G20 does not have a secretary, and that has been the biggest challenge the G20 has faced ever since from 2008, it has taken on a political role after the financial crisis. So how do you ensure coherence? And that, I think, goes back to your point and the point that Marine made uh, earlier today in the panel of the IPSA. Perhaps IPSA, because the three countries which preside over the G20 are IPSA uh, in the next uh, three years. So probably there'll be some coherence, but uh, how much of it can be implemented will depend on each member of the G20. And that, I think, brings us back to where we started, which is the United Nations. And I think that this is something that the United Nations must uh, seize the moment the tech envoy has been visiting all the countries. He has put forward his proposals. And I think in September, when we uh, have this meeting in New York, uh, this is the opportunity that we need to put our collective uh, shoulders together and make the UN the, the primary framework for digital cooperation. Otherwise, what Wolfgang has said is, is the reality. There is a fracture, there is a confrontation, and that is driven by factors which are beyond uh, digital and internet issues. The, uh, those are factors which are beyond uh, uh, the, the stakeholders. And I think in terms of India, it's useful to remember that uh, whatever I talked about earlier today is based on the multi-stakeholder model. And I think that that answers probably some of the questions which people may have Thank about you. SEO and things like that. India is going uh, firmly with the multi-stakeholder model. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ashoka, for this three summary of comparative between Shanghai Cooperation Organization, G20 and the UN just to put things in the right context. We move to Marilia. We'll have to shorten intervention of our um, uh, speakers in order to stay within the time frame, although I will, uh, I may be declared persona non grata for bad time management. Marilia, over to you. Thank you, Jovan. My point will be really brief. I just think it is increasingly important that we build bridges between discussions on internet governance and the issue of the political economy or geoeconomics. Um, and the discussion on fragmentation is a very good example. Ginger mentioned in the chat how discussions in the IGF were overtaken by fragmentation. But I think our main problem, at least right now, is not yet technical fragmentation, but fragmentation of markets, even be it on the side of the governments, through practice such as onshoring, French shoring, et cetera, be it on the side of companies who decide to dis deserve or underserve certain regions. And this is leading to a market that is really fragmented. So bridges are needed there. Thank you, Jovan. Thank you, uh, Marilia. Uh, we move to, Braz uh, to, to Africa and uh, Kate, uh, your quick uh, take on the discussion. Mind you, we'll have extra half an hour with most of our panelists and other Diplo expert for uh, diving deeper into all these aspects. Over to you, Kate. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Jovan. Now, I just say that 150 or 200 years ago, to go back further than your 25 years, uh, there was exploration. 
global exploration was the fashion. But this was followed another 50 years or so later by colonization. Uh, and I think there's a danger that uh, the opportunities that have been opened up by the internet uh, are going to be overtaken by a kind of uh, colonization, uh, depending on how certain regions uh, do the legislation, as well as the behavior of the OTTs and big tech. And uh, what Rodney said, I, I found uh, resonance. So I think uh, data governance is one of the really critical issues that needs to be understood by all governments so that we create a fairer space um, where conflict is uh, less likely because we handle this issue uh, correctly and uh, the opportunities of the internet are not followed by digital colonization. Thank you, Kat, for introducing also this term exploration and uh, colonization and linking to data. Uh, Richard, uh, you will have extra half an hour. Maybe you can just give a hint what you would like to focus in extra half an hour. Okay. Well, I look at the different comments that were made on the European Union, and I will only take one at the moment, which is this question on sovereignty. So I repeat what Marilia just wrote. She wrote, how sovereign can EU policy on digital be vis-a-vis -vis the US? especially on difficult issues such as the relation with China. It seems to me that the war in Ukraine pushed the EU back a couple of years when it comes to its independent thinking. It's now relying on US as its protective big brother. Uh, Susonia mentioned that too. Um, well, uh, first of all, this is the question. This is precisely the question, and this is why I said that for the European Union in 2023, the slogan, the motto will be can Europe be back or Europe is back? Uh, the question I believe is divided into two parts. First of all, can EU, can the European Union rely only in no on norms and regulation when it comes to asserting its sovereignty? It did so with the Digital Service Act, uh, but is it enough? Is it enough to regulate? Is it enough to tax? Is it enough to, let's say, force companies to respect a certain number of norms? Is it enough to achieve sovereignty? At the moment, the answer given by Commissioner Breton is no. You can't achieve digital sovereignty only by norms. And I believe this is the main new thing in the European debate, because a lot of players were either thinking or playing like having norms is enough. Now the EU realized that you should also have instruments and in the terms of digital affairs, instruments are company, are innovation, are labs. So can the EU uh, in a way uh, use this decade to come from 2023 to 2030 to uh, bounce back in terms of innovation and in terms simply of internet companies? That Richard. will be the main challenge. Good. Uh, thank you for this. We'll leave it for the, this extra half an hour discussion to dive deeper. We just move to Rodney for your quick and short uh, re reflection. And then uh, Susonia will wrap up our uh, in very interesting debate. Rodney. Thank you, Jovan. And, and uh, I'm mindful of your time. So I want to thank you for, for inviting us to share our perspective from the region. Um, I believe the issue of sovereignty, which has been coming out, uh, is it has to be redefined in the in the borderless digital world and that we are in and their implications for policies outside of the internet and technology, for example, taxation. I mentioned digital nomads and how they, if they're working in one jurisdiction and paying taxes and, and others. So there will be a huge impact uh, there outside of technology issues. But thank you very much uh, for, for inviting us. Thank you. And take on the Rodney's invitation for the digital nomads uh, and the visiting Caribbean region. So Sonia, uh, over to you. Thank you uh, from my side for great comments and uh, reflections to, for panelists and all of you. So Sonia. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. And it was a great discussion to follow. Thanks to everyone atten who, who attended and of course our exceptional uh, experts and our moderator, Johan. 
So, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, we have an extra uh, part that will follow in a few minutes. So we're going to be using Zoom's breakout rooms uh, future. And if you can just have a look down there, it's among the options. So we have, if, oh, well, well, actually, no, the pop-up screen just came up with the breakout rooms. And here you can choose out of six breakout rooms. Quickly, I'll go through them. Uh, one is with Ambassador Mukherjee and Maria Marciel. Uh, it's the IBSA Momentum Room. We have cybersecurity in Africa. Uh, with Kate Gatel and Vlada Radnovic. Can AI draft predictions? Experience with chat G GPT with Jovan Kurbalia. The EU in global digital geopolitics with Richard Worley and Stephanie borg -Salia. The Digital Watch, how to follow digital developments in 2023 with Sorina Telenau and Katarina Bojovic. And finally, AI governance with Katarina Hone. So uh, you can make your pick as well. The, it, the discussion will be for 30 minutes. Um, I'm not sure if it would be wise to switch between rooms, but I think if you do it, maybe perhaps just uh, once during the 30 minutes, maybe uh, you'd like to attend more than one room and then the event will be wrapped up. So, yes, please choose one of them and join the discussion and just feel free to once you're in the breakout rooms, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. Uh, but if you don't feel comfortable, of course, uh, writing is always still an option. <laughs> 